All right, so in the last video, we worked through the general theory of practical sampling. In this video, we're going to work through a very specific instance of it. So in this video, we are going to work with the continuous time signal x of t, which is a sinc squared function. And we are going to sample that with this waveform pt of t. So pt of t in this example is kind of this rectangularly pulsed waveform. Some of the parameters are that it has an amplitude of 1, so a is 1. Its period is 0.005 seconds, and the width, which I'll call tau, that's the width of this pulse, is 0.0125. So the period is about four times, or it is four times longer than the pulse width. So this is the signal that we are going to sample our continuous time signal x of t with. So we need to work through a variety of kind of preliminary calculations to know what the spectrum of the sampled signal looks like. That's what we want to do. We want to know what does the sampled signal look like in the frequency domain. So the first thing I need to know is what is the spectrum of my original continuous time signal? What is x of omega? Well, that's not too hard to do. Since we are dealing with a sinc squared, I can do some simple manipulations and then do a table lookup. So let's start off with sinc squared 10 pi t, which was our starting signal. And let's do just a little bit of rearranging. Instead of 10 pi, I'll write 10 pi is 20 pi over 2. That doesn't change anything. And then I'm going to multiply by 1. So right here, this is actually just 1. Everything cancels there, right? But the reason I like writing it like this is because now this part of my signal is in a form that is in a table. This looks like w over 2 pi sinc squared of wt over 2, where w is 20 pi. So I like to get it into this form because the Fourier transform table that I work with has this in the table and it tells me if this is my time domain signal then my frequency domain signal is a triangular signal in the frequency domain omega whose total width is 2 w. So at this point since I've done a little bit of algebra and manipulated this into the right form I can kind of write down what the Fourier transform is of my signal it's x of omega equals 20 pi over 2, 2 pi over 20 pi, right? I still have this scale factor I need to bring along. And then this part right here is my triangular function with capital W equal to 20 pi. So 2 times 20 pi is 40 pi. This is the spectrum of my original signal. And I'll need that here in a little bit. I'll go ahead and simplify. 2 pi over 20 pi, the pi's cancel. 2 over 20 is 1 over 10 or 0.1 and there is the spectrum and I can sketch it. It has a height of 0.1 and it's a triangle with a total width of 40. So that means it goes from minus 20 pi to 20 pi. So this is what the spectrum of my original continuous time signal looks like. All right, the other thing I'm going to need is I'm going to need the frequency domain representation of my practical sampling waveform. So like in the previous video, we'll go ahead and write down the Fourier series of this signal. Again, I'll go ahead and use the compact Fourier series representation. And in another video, I'll actually work through how to find the Fourier series of a rectangular pulsed waveform. For now, we're going to go ahead and just use that result without having to derive the C0 and Cn from scratch. So I'll just do a little bit of a write down. Notice what I've written here. Normally, in the general expression for the compact trigonometric Fourier series, it has a theta n written down, right? Well, if you work through the math for this even time domain signal, it turns out that all the thetas are zero, so I've not included those. If we go watch the other video, we can just do a write-down for the Fourier series coefficients. It turns out that C0 is always equal to A, the amplitude of the pulsed waveform, times tau, the width of the rectangular pulses, divided by t. So for us, a was 1, tau was 0.0125, and t was 0.05. So we can compute that. It turns out to be 1 fourth. And then we also have a nice expression for cn. It turns out that the coefficients cn are equal to the magnitude of the ans, and the ans are equal to this expression right here. Again, for this video, this expression that I have circled is just kind of appearing out of thin air. But if you go watch the Fourier series video for the pulsed rectangular waveform, we derive this result. So 2 over n pi sine of tau pi n over t 
2. Again, for this problem, we were told the value of tau, we were told the value of t, so we can just kind of plug in. And that's what I've done right there. And then we need to compute these for different values of n, when n is 1, when n is 2, etc. We can plug these values into our calculator to get out numerical values and know what all of the cn's are. So now we know what our sampled signal is. Since we know what pt of t is, we know what x of t is, we can compute the sampled signal xs of t. We simply multiply our original continuous time signal times pt of t. And if we do that using this Fourier series representation for pt of t, we know what's going to happen. I'm going to have c0 x of t plus c1 cosine of 1 times omega naught times x of t, just that first harmonic plus c2 times 2 times the fundamental times x of t plus c3 cosine 3, etc. All right, so this is our sampled signal in the time domain. Let's go ahead and analyze that just a little bit. Just to make things simple, I'll rewrite that expression of our sampled signal in the time domain. And then what we're going to do is we are going to look at the spectrum of the sampled signal. So I would like to take this signal into the frequency domain. So to do that, I just need to look at this side and take each of these terms into the frequency domain because the Fourier transform is a linear operation. So one by one, I can go into the frequency domain. So on the left side, xs of t becomes xs of omega. That is equal to 1 4th x of t in time is 1 4th x of omega by definition in frequency. And then here's where things get a little bit more interesting. The C1 just comes along as a constant, and then we need to think about what is cosine omega naught t in the frequency domain. Well, that's a pair of impulses at plus and minus omega naught with also a 1 over 2 pi out front. So that's just a table lookup. Cosine and time are pairs of impulses in frequency. Here I have a multiplication in time. A multiplication in time becomes a convolution in frequency, if you include the 2 pi scale factor. And then x of t in time becomes x of omega in frequency. So this term right here, I've transformed into the frequency domain right here. And now I can do very similar things for the rest of these terms. Exact same thought process. C2 comes along as a constant. A cosine of 2 omega naught is pairs of impulses at plus and minus 2 omega naught. Multiplication in time becomes convolution in frequency. x of t in time is x of omega in frequency. Same thing for the next term, etc. Notice all the two pi's here cancel nicely. And then also we can use the property that when I convolve, I have x of omega convolved with impulses in each one of these lines. Well, that's not too hard to deal with because when I convolve a, something with an impulse, all that happens is that thing gets placed at the location of the impulse. So if I want to place x of omega at omega naught where this is located, I simply write down x of omega minus omega naught. Similarly, when I convolve x of omega with where this impulse is located, I just write down x of omega plus omega naught. So convolving with impulses is pretty easy, and I can do that exact same thing on the rest of these. Convolve x of omega with impulses at plus and minus 2 omega naught, and I end up with this. Okay, Do that for the third one as well, plus dot, 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 dot. So now I have an expression for the frequency domain representation of the sampled signal. And remember, I computed what x of omega was at the start of this, so we can actually go ahead and sketch what this looks like in the frequency domain. Just as you remember, t was equal to 0 0.05. That means the fundamental frequency is 1 over that, or 20, which means the radial frequency that we're dealing with here is 2 times 20, which is 40 pi. So that's my fundamental radial frequency. So if I want to go ahead and swap those out, I can. I'll go ahead and rewrite the expression that we had in the previous chart. We'll sketch this. So first of all, there is one triangle located at the origin whose amplitude has been scaled by 1 fourth. Originally, our amplitude was 0.1, so I have scaled that by a fourth, 0.1 over 4. The rest of these terms are all shifted up and down some multiple of omega naught, which is 40 pi. 
So 40 pi is going to be an important spot. That is where my next triangle is located. I also have another located at minus 40 pi. Well, over here, each of these triangles have a height of C1. So I have sketched those. I'll do the same thing for the rest of these terms. Plus and minus 2 omega naught. That's going to be at plus 80 pi and minus 80 pi. And they're going to have heights of C2. Okay. So this is what my sampled spectrum looks like. And that concludes the problem that we wanted to work through. We wanted to work through what happens when I sample a continuous time signal with what I called a, quote, practical pulsed waveform. It ends up being very similar to when we sample it with an impulsed waveform with ideal impulses in that the original spectrum gets shifted up and down the frequency axis. The only difference is that the scale factors aren't all the same. The scale factors end up being these Fourier series coefficients, and they end up usually decaying a little bit as frequency increases. I can still see my original spectrum sitting right here. So we could still recover my original X of T if I put a low pass filter right here to recover my original spectrum and reject all the images. So the recovery strategy is exactly the same.